Um, Excuse me, there was a prayer request. That uh, Mel? Mel? There's an emergency room right now with her little boy. Oh, what is it? She didn't say what it was. Okay. Father, we just come to you uh, holding up Mel and her child that's in the emergency room. We don't have any information, but you totally know what the situation is. And we ask you to move according to your heart and according to your will to uh, minister to that family. And uh, we thank you that we can entrust these things to you. We thank you, Father, that you're a good Father, Jesus. We thank you that, that your nail-scarred hands will move in this situation in a way that will glorify your Father and bring forth more of Christ in, in us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. Um, <clears throat> We're still in verse 2. I want to say this again, though, and I don't know how it's in this chapter, chapter 16, but there is just a huge, huge thing that happens in this chapter that ripples all the way through. Um, and um, you could say it ripples till today, but, <clears throat> but of course you might just assume one aspect or one thought behind it instead of what's really the, the thing that it's bringing out. Anyway, um, in chapter, I mean in verse 2 here, um, I shall read it again. And Sarah said unto Abram, Behold now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. And uh, um, I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarah. Okay, so at the beginning here, in this first part of that verse, we have um, we have what is, in some translations, is translated the folly of God. It's found in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 where it's called the foolishness of God. But um, in my studying, uh, I have found that it's almost better that it be called the folly of God because we don't understand it and we never recognize it when it comes hardly. And... Um, we um, we get tripped up a lot when it's certainly manifested in our daily lives or in a, a moment in our life or something like that. Um, but Sarah here makes an important statement, maybe an important realization, um, and seems to be, and I say that, seems to be in tune with at least one aspect um, of what's going on in her life, and I would say what's going on in her miserable circumstances. Um, and Sarah said unto Abraham, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. So um, I wrote, I'll read this, for her to say, for her to so say might signify that she knows somewhat of the nature of the folly of God. The folly of God in this situation is that he promises all this to a man who has a barren wife. All of this great stuff. The only guy on the planet at the time that God's talking to. You know. And he's making promises that, uh, but he's also making circumstances and the promises don't match up with the circumstances. And if you begin to really, really seek the heart of the Lord to understand the folly of God, you will not be far from the kingdom of God. Um, the, uh, part of the folly is that there is no hope of the promise being fulfilled while she is in that condition. So, regardless of our situation, it's sort of paradoxical. It is, okay, the Lord said this, or the Lord wants me to do this, 
but he's not giving me any way to do it. The Lord said I was this or that, but everything says I'm nothing like that. <clears throat> so let's, let's use uh, an example of Joseph. Joseph has a dream. All of his brothers and his father will bow down to him in obeisance. <clears throat> and so he's, you know, he's just like, I know this is from God. See, that's the problem. We go shoot our mouth off. Not We, we know that it's of God, and then we go share it thinking everybody's going to get it because it's of God. You may not believe this, but I know what I'm talking about. You get hold of something, it's of God. <laughs> you go share it and you go, man, everybody's going to love this. And then they kill you and throw you in a ditch. You know what I mean? Joseph. <laughs> and didn't kill him, but they were going to kill him. And um, so um, the trail from that point gets worse and worse. Primarily, I mean, they already didn't like him because he was wearing a coat of many colors. So I don't want to start preaching Joseph yet. But, but, they, but when he had this dream, it was like the dream triggered the worst. It's like the dream triggered the exact opposite so that you would go, you know, maybe I shouldn't have shared that, you know, or, or something, you know. Usually it's, uh, what did I do wrong? Did I sin? Where did I mess up? I don't know. You know, we go through all this stuff. We don't understand the folly of God. <clears throat> um, we understand it if somebody explains it to us. But we don't really, really have a grasp on that. And, and I will tell you that that class that I'm doing on Wednesday, in part two of that, which is not the next class, but the next part that I'll do at some time in the future really goes into explaining the folly of God um, as it applies to us. So, um, so I'll read this again. Uh, part of the folly is that there is no hope of the promise being fulfilled while she is in that condition. But the paradox is that the one, capitalized one, God, the one who is making the great promises is also the one who has restrained her from bearing. All right. Now, if you don't understand the folly of God, I promise you, you're just, if you get in any such situation that involves it, you're just going to be confused. You're going to go, well, what's, what's going on here? What's this about? And everything. And and uh, confusion is really not the thing you're supposed to be in, per se. <laughs> you know, it would be nice to really be in tune with the Lord. <clears throat> um, okay. So the last part of verse 2 shows that on another front, she really has little understanding of how God wants to accomplish his plan. I pray thee, go in unto my maid, and it may be that I may obtain children by her. But just like God told Abram that it would come from not would not come from outside, it would come from inside of him. The seed would come from the inside. Okay, so she's working on a basis of the outside. And I, let me make this statement, and you tell me what you think. There's nothing that you can do outwardly that ultimately brings Christ revealed and formed, revealed and formed in you to manifest his life. What do y'all think of that? <clears throat> okay, well, what about searching the scriptures? Okay, but didn't the Pharisees search the scriptures? And they never saw Jesus. But Paul, who was a Pharisee, did see Jesus. And many other people. Um, so, you know, why, why did Paul see Christ in the Word. Okay, well, my statement was this, so work with me here. My statement was this, that there's nothing you can do outwardly that ultimately really results in Christ being revealed in you and Christ 
coming out of you. Something was working inside of Paul. Do you agree with that? Yeah, in his heart. Something was working in his heart towards the Lord. Something was not working in the Pharisee's heart towards the Lord. In fact, you know, well, it just wasn't. All those years and all that time, they were not seeing the Lord. That something that works within us has to be lined up with the heart of God, with the what we call it the will of God. Many times I say the heart of God because we say when we say the will of God, we automatically go, well, it's God's will that I go to Timbuktu and, you know, share the word. And, and you know, I go, okay, was, why would God want you to go to Michigan? <laughs> you know, uh, but our, our, be, our thing is God told me, God told me this is his will and I have to go do it, okay? Well, God uses paradoxes. He uses his folly to, if, he'll t if he tells you something like that, there's a good chance that everything's going to get worse before it gets better. Joseph, I mean, you can go all through the scripture. Abraham, you know, um, it is because God's first purpose is not you doing the will of God. His first purpose is that Christ be formed in you. And to do that is going to require negative circumstances. Okay? If negative circumstances for a while leads to the fullness of Christ in you, would you, trade, would you do the trade-off? I heard at least one no. <clears throat> Maybe that was on Skype. I don't know. <clears throat> um, in this case, it not only was going to happen, but God wanted Sarah and wanted uh, Abram, Abraham eventually called, lined up with him in his purpose and in his heart because the purpose came out of his heart. And the will of God came out of his heart, out of his being. <clears throat> so, um, but just just like God told Abram that it would come from out would not come from outside but inside. So it will be for Sarah. It's got to come from the inside. She's gonna have it. God is not gonna tell you anything like that that pertains to his son and then you just go out and start a ministry or you just go do something and you think that that's the son the son is the son and god wants him from the inside out of you first you know and the way that he quote unquote blesses a, a ministry is that it's christ not that it goes perfect or that's it's successful or whatever but that it's christ you know, I mean, people, people could look at this place and say, well, there's nothing to this place. There's only like four people and, you know, there's more than that. But I'm just saying, you know, they could, they could do that and say, well, it's not worth anything. Really, I mean, we're doing really well. Praise God. You know, I, I'm not, I don't want to look down on that, or what they're doing. I leave that to the Lord. Like they should leave us to the Lord, you know. But I... I'm not, my, my focus isn't there. My focus is as long as, this is important, it won't be forever, it will be forever as long as, as long as our hearts are going after the Lord in a way that pleases and blesses Him. Okay. And if not, do, do you agree? We probably shouldn't even be going then. Okay. Um, but see, I made all those covenants with the Lord when new creation first started because I came out of a situation that I didn't think it was the Lord at that time. And I said, Lord, if this, if this one gets off on this and that and whatever, then I don't want it anymore. <clears throat> um,
So the Lord knows where it will come from, but she doesn't. Abraham knows where it's going to come from, but she doesn't. Abraham knows that it's not a mental thing to be figured out, right? No, he, do, he probably doesn't yet <laughs> because he's going to make a lot of mistakes along the way. But he at least knows with him and her standing there, this has got to come out of me. This has got, anybody ever just felt that so strongly? Yeah. This has got to be Jesus. He's got to come out of me. I, want, I don't want me serving him alone. I want yeah. his life serving the Father. Yes. And it's like, I, I don't want to live. I don't want to, I just want that. And that will, you know, that will be enough. At this, at, at this point, Hagar is mentioned as an answer to Sarah's problem concerning what she does not have. Remember last class we talked about what she has and what she doesn't have. What she has is a handmaiden named Hagar. What she doesn't have is the ability to bring forth the seed. Okay, so she's going, okay. Well, I don't have the ability to bring, I don't have the ability in me to bring forth the seed. See, we, can, can we say it like this sometimes? I don't have the ability in me to bring forth the seed yet. Can we believe God's still working? You know, we might give up on ourselves, but he doesn't. Because why? Because he doesn't give up on his son. See, see, and he won't. <clears throat> it's when we throw up our hands and go, okay, well, I just should go back to the world. You know, well, the devil's waiting with arms wide open. Come on, no, before they mistreating you, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> um, so, so Sarah is thinking about this. You, and, you know, remember, we talked about it. She's been 10 years in the land, right? 10 years and has not brought forth the seed and hadn't got a word from the Lord yet personally. So she's thinking about it and she's going, okay, well, it's gonna be, it's gonna come from him, Abraham, it's gonna come from him. So I have a handmaiden, so we'll try to achieve it in this way. Well, um, I wrote, when we think of Hagar, we are automatically brought back to Sarah's deficiency. This is all about a deficiency. Okay? Deficiency. We are deficient, and we don't want to be deficient. Okay? So, let's say that we know that probably her motives were right on several points. Number one... God seemed to be speaking to her husband, and she's pretty sure it was God, and so she wanted to have a seed for God's sake, for her husband's sake, because he's been 10 years in the land too. So she's desiring that for him, okay? So <clears throat> those are pure motives, but again, you have to realize, I mean, you can do a lot of things outwardly, and that's fine. But you have to realize that that seed, the Lord wants it to come out of you. Okay? I mean, you can bless somebody or do something out here, and that's fine, but that should be the result of already having the seed, not trying to get the seed. The way you try to get the seed is you're not considering all this, and I'm, you know, I'm trusting that God's word is true and that his heart is true. His heart is that he wants his life, his son's life, flowing out of us like rivers of water. All right. So um, when we think of Hagar, we automatically are brought back to Sarah's deficiency. That is when the Egyptian handmaiden was presented in the story. She hadn't been mentioned, really, by name, certainly until this time came. Sarah, Abraham's wife, bare him no children. Okay. 
All right. Since this is the condition Abram and Sarah are facing, then the carnal mind has to find a way around the negative issues. All right. So that's the deal. Tree of the knowledge of good and evil versus the tree of life. Tree of knowledge of good and evil uh, says, okay, there's, you know, there's some evil. There's, we're, there's some situations here that are messed up and we can't seem to, you know, get it fixed. And we need to find a way around this negative issue. Okay? So you know, looking at, at the evil fruit on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So we look over here at the good fruit on it and say, well, this will do it. <laughs> you know, that's where we look. That's the carnal mind. That's what we do. Oh, okay, so we need to, we need to fix this. You're barren, so, well, we got some good fruit here or the possibility of it. Or you look at the, same, the tree and you do the same thing. We may not realize that we're looking at a tree when we're making those decisions. We may not realize it. But we are because we're scratching around for answers that only God can fulfill. And, see, that's, again, this is the conundrum. This is the folly of God. We get freaked out because we say, well, God said, or, or God, you know, da-da-da-da, but it's not happening. And so we're, you know, we'll be good, we'll be bad, we'll be, you know, whatever. It's all over the tree, you know. Just trying to figure a way. There is no way to be figured. The way has already been figured, you know. In your heart, seek the Lord. When you search the scriptures, ask the Holy Spirit. Um, tell him on a regular basis you know you're not it. It won't, it won't destroy you to do that. <laughs> uh, that Jesus is it. Then the Father is, you know. So that's the good thing because we say, I want the Son. Well, where's the Son ever come from? A Father. Right? You say, well, that's too simple, you know. But a son only comes from a father, you know. Yes, there's a, but, but the father brings forth. The father, it's his seed that brings forth the son. All right. Um, I wrote, this isn't, let me make sure I'm through with this part up here. Uh, because the coming forth of the seed was the constant focus of Abraham, this caused Sarah to be fixated on herself and her condition instead of the Lord. I think I read this to you last time, but uh, he at least looked to the Lord as source, but she begins to look to her own resources and means. All right. So um, maybe for the first time he's noticing in Sarah an openness, a, a you know, I'll work with you. You know, since she was barren, she couldn't. You know, I'll work with you and we'll do this thing. Um, because Abram's affinity for Ishmael is pretty strong when he comes forth. And, and he believes at that point that Ishmael really is. Now, don't you think that we should be able to look at Ishmael and go, that ain't him? Well, you can't and won't. Because he's not, Jesus is not going to come out and go, it's me, you know, and then a halo, and then angels go circling around his head, and we're going, whoa, that's him, that's him, you know. Um, he showed up in a manger. There wasn't even room for him in the inn. He's in there with stinky sheep. He's a lamb, remember? And he, you know, he doesn't have a problem with it. Okay, so, um, uh, 
Um, instead of looking to the Lord, we look to whatever we have at hand, which that's what, that's what Sarah did, what she had at hand. And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. <clears throat> um, there's a, a sentence in here that we haven't addressed yet. It says, it may be that I may obtain children by her. That's an important phrase. I mean, these verses, these phrases that comes up, and these things that are being said, it's either a story that we're just reading a story, or it has to do with eternal reality for us. And if it's just a story, or you know, it's like a bedtime story. Well, I'll read you a bedtime story. Oh, okay. And then, you know, would you read me that bedtime story again? Yeah. Da, da, da. And then, you know, somebody reads it to you enough times, you know the story. Oh, I know what happens next. Well, it's, in a sense, we're like children. <clears throat> because we've read it as a bedtime story enough times that we can rehearse the story. But we haven't seen the life of the story yet. We haven't, we haven't wept over the story. We haven't bled over the story, as it were. We haven't, we haven't had our heart broken over the story because it's just a story to us. We would never say that. We would never say that. But if we have read the story enough that we know it and yet we're not prepared for what's what it's going to bring forth <clears throat> because what I'm saying right now again will be important as we go further into this chapter. One of the motivations for Sarah being open to this plan is that I may obtain, right? That I may obtain children by her. That I may obtain. So her motives are not pure for God and for her husband. And she may be deceived, self-deceived, and assuming that it is that. And so she merrily goes along making plans that are only going to cause trouble down the road. Not just trouble, but continuous, horrendous trouble for the true seed that does come forth. And <clears throat> um, so... She wants a child for me. I, it, will, it will raise my status. It will take away the, the shame. It will do all of this, okay? All right. So do you think that you're going to get the seed as long as you're doing it just for your sake and not for his sake? And the answer is no. No, there's no way. And so that's why I put so much emphasis on the heart. Let your heart not be about you but him. Nobody is perfect. Nobody has complete pure motives in everything they do. <clears throat> but, you know, you've heard me share this many times, and I'll share it again because I think it could save your life eventually, and that is that there are times that I really want to do something, and I'm afraid that God is going to say, no, go do this. But I really want to do this thing, and so I'm waiting on the answer from the Lord, and he says, okay, go ahead and do it. <clears throat> and now I'm really in trouble because I'm faced with a decision. Am I going to do it because I really wanted it before he even told me I could do it? Or am I going to do it because he wanted me to do it? Did you know you can divide up those motives? You can do that. You can divide your soul from your spirit. You can divide you from the Lord and tell what's the difference. You know, I don't always know what's the Lord, but I always know what's me. <laughs> you know, okay, this is me. I'm wanting this. I really wish this would happen this way. And then the Lord says, okay, you can do it. And you go, it's going to happen this way. That's your flesh. 
I rejoice in the Lord my God. <laughs> He's going, you know, I was hoping that you would see the difference and just go, you know what? I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it for the Lord. I'm not going to do it to please my flesh. I'm going to lay it down. This is going to be an altar, and I'm going to lay it down, and I am going to go with him and his heart and his spirit. Okay? And trust me, you would be surprised how many opportunities in a day or in a week come up where you can do that, where you're going, you know, well, I know this is my flesh, but, and then God says, well, okay, I want you to do this, and you're going, didn't he know this was my flesh? You know, yes, he, he's not fooled, but he, he's giving you an out. If he said don't do it, then you'd really be freaking out, right? <laughs> It'd be like, no, don't say no to that, you know? But it's like, by him doing that, he's actually giving you an out. You can literally go, okay, I will do it, but now I'm going to do it because I'm with you, not for my own self. Anyway, hopefully those are helpful. Um, <clears throat> the real translation of uh, that I may obtain children uh, is in, in that it says, Sarah says, a child for me. That's what she's saying. That's the real translation, a child for me. A child for me, you know. I'm going to get it through this external thing. God's only going to get it through you, or he's not going to get it at all. Right? <clears throat> When these are issues of just you standing before God, um, we, we will be confronted with, whether that's tomorrow or next week or next year or, you know, in the sweet by and by, however you want to look at that, we will stand on our own merits with him. Is my heart yours or is my heart mine and I want you to bless it? I, one of the things, and, and I'm hoping these things are beneficial to you guys, but and some of you have heard these before, but one of the things that really, really has helped me over the years is that I picture God on the other side of this table, and there's this big table, and when the issues, the different issues and things come up, I lay it all piece by piece out on that table. And, I, and then I say, Lord, hand me back what you want me to have. But when I put it on that table, that's like an altar. I mean, it is an altar because I'm saying, no to all of it or part of it or whatever. Hand me back what you want me to have. So he'll hand it to me and I'll go, okay, I know this is from you then. And I can, I can go with clarity. And when he doesn't, and, and when he doesn't hand one of them back, if there's one of them, I'm going, pick up that one now. <laughs> you know, come on, Lord, it's, it's, it's to my left, you're right. Right there on top. You know? I, it helps me because I'm prepared to be confronted with my choices or my, what I really want. Sometimes you don't really know and sometimes you lie to yourself and say, Oh, I just want what the Lord wants. You don't find out until you put it all on there, and then you go, you choose, and he doesn't seem to be even noticing what you want. You know, and it's like, well, I guess I really care a lot about that one right there. You know? <clears throat> well, he knows. He knows. 
he knows what's going on in us. But I think that when we, if we be honest with him, we say, I really do want your will. Because we all say that, right? I really do want your will. When you do it like that, then you find out if you really do want his will. Then it's not as easy to walk around all day, every day, and go, well, I really do want his will. And everybody goes, well, she or he really does want his will. And you're going, yes, I do. Until you lay it down, you go, hold up there, Lord. <laughs> There's, see this one right here? <laughs> you know, I know you want that for me. And he's going, no, I don't. You're going, you don't? You know, you, all this stuff. I'm just trying to tell you. Most people don't want to go this way, so just ignore it if it doesn't mean anything to you. But to me, it has really, really helped time and time again because I, ha I will have to be confronted with the things that I set out there that I really want and I, I don't want him to take away. And then I have to deal with myself in the sense of, well, I have to deal if I've been lying to myself. I have to deal if I've been just covering over so that I never had to see anything. Uh, and then I could call it all Jesus and that I could pretty much live uh, deceived that I'm a really spiritual person when, you know, just a few of those kind of sessions <laughs> kind of really show, show, have shown me. And have helped me because then I, I say, well, I want the Lord. We say that one too. Well, I want the Lord. I want the Lord. Well, do I? I mean, it, and if his hand is reaching for it to take it off the table, you know, could we leave it on there and you work at changing me? You know, I mean, you're, we're, we're connivers. We really are. We are. And... Um, I think that you can be saved and you know go through stuff without really knowing whatever and it's okay you'll be saved as it were but you know for me I know that that's the kind of stuff that confronts me and see I have a helper in this though I have the Holy Spirit I can say right then and there I can say okay I messed up I'm really messed up and I really want that and I'm gonna need you to to do something in me and uh, sometimes I've even told him please ask the father not to pull that off of the table and throw it away forever could we just leave it there until you deal with me and then I'll throw it away but if you know like I said it just it's been helpful to me yes Right. And then, you know, at a certain point, he says, "Then Jonah is bone to bone, you know, so that it's even like the other Christians that where the heart is dead and they put forth their hand." Yeah, he breathed life into them, and they stood up, and you know, <clears throat> I guess off the subject of that, when me, you, and Cassie went to Five Below, <clears throat> I took a picture of it, but. When you walk into Five Below, the front door, right just slightly catacornered, right in front, one of the first things you see is a wheelbarrow full of skeleton bones and, head, you know, skulls and head, uh, bones and all that, full, full up. And so, me and Cassie walk over to it and I said, can these bones live? <laughs> Even though it's funny, I, he's never not 
he's, he's all, the Lord's always there, you know. I mean, he is. He uses all these things. <clears throat> um, she is willing to give Hagar unto her husband in order that she also might get something out of it. To do it this way would also mean that she would be in charge of the situation. <clears throat> Within that translation is also the thought of building her up, building Sarah up. Sarah expects that Hagar's child will build her up. Since she is a woman with little or no power, she will exercise power over another woman who is of lower status than her. Is that, is that possible, ladies? Flesh, yeah, it's the flesh. It's also the flesh. <laughs> um, <clears throat> after all, that has been their relationship so far. See, it's just like, <clears throat> I mean, I don't, I don't really understand it because if the life of Christ is there, then we're... Uh, you know whether somebody promotes you or some or you're somebody puts you down um, you're still with the Lord your your acceptance is the Lord you know your acceptance is you know that you may feel like you're rejected and everything else but you're probably if you do it in the right spirit you're more accepted than you've ever been if you do it in the, the spirit of the lamb if you do it in that right spirit then you're so accepted you're so loved you're so you know, he's, he's proud of you. That's, that's exactly what he wants out of us. But, you know, um, <clears throat> you know we, so we, we get, you know, this is Adam. We get comfortable with being low, and then we're low, and, you know, it's, yeah, you know, and so, hey, this is okay. This is, I'm doing good. I'm doing really good. And then we get promoted, and then it's like, yeah, you know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm something now, and, you know, God loves me and people love me and all this kind of stuff. I thought God loved you because you <laughs> went with this, his spirit, you know. And <clears throat> anyway, so that we got that going on right here with Sarah and Hagar. But maybe her offer is not singularly focused on self-gain. Maybe she comes up with this plan out of guilt also. Why? She may have thought this whole crisis was due to something she had done wrong that had caused God to shut up her womb. Is that possible that she could have thought that? Yeah. You know, what? Oh, no. But it's always, here's the question. It's always, well, what have I done wrong? Right? Well, you know, I, I know that it must be this, but what have I done wrong? God won't show me, and I keep asking him, what have I done wrong? Okay. Um, what if, well, let's just put it like this. I mean, she didn't do anything wrong. It just wasn't the timing of the Lord. You know, there's a timing. You remember that? Everybody remember? The will of God, the timing of God, and done in his spirit. Right? Right? Most people just say, well, the important thing is God's will. And now that I know his will, and then they run off to do it. But there may be a timing to that. And so it's, it's like, okay, well, I've got God's will. Now what is your timing? But then when the timing comes, he cares about what spirit you do that in also. In fact, that's probably the most important part from his viewpoint of the situation. And we most Christians that I know really don't, are not aware of anything beyond the will of God. Once I get heard, hear the will of God, I know that's God, and I'm going to run with it, and bless God, I'm going to do it, you know. Um, so she may have thought this whole crisis was due to something she had done wrong that had caused God to shut up her womb. She may have surmised that she had kept Abram from receiving all the blessings and promises that God would have bestowed on him, that it's her fault. Is it possible someone would do that? 
Is it possible that someone could do that and then really think they're spiritual because they're doing that? Because they're saying, you know, well, it's my fault, and, you know, I'm just the one that caused this whole thing, but, you know, I'm, I'm not blaming Abraham or Hagar or, or the bird bath or whatever. You know, I don't know what that is, but that, you know, it's, <clears throat> you know, you, trust me, Adam can find, quote, unquote, spirituality in any situation, no matter how bad it is or whatever, or just always working it and conniving and, and, and feeding something in there. You know, this, it's like this, you know, it goes back in, you know, feed me. You know, you know this, this thing within us, this fleshly beast that really ultimately is us until the cross has fully dealt with us. Um, <clears throat> but on, let me just say this. On the other hand, a person can can be so, uh, have such a poor self-image, not that we want to have a good self-image, but I, I understand these things. I haven't been raised in an orphanage. You can, you can have such a poor self-image that you just take all the blame anyway, you know. And you just, you know, well, I don't deserve this anyway, and, or I do deserve this you know, not being able to bring forth, I deserve this because, you know. And, <clears throat> you know, what we have to do when we're in that type of a state is that we have to begin to move from our identity based on birth all the way up to this point to find our identity with him. Now, oneness does miracles for that, but many don't really understand oneness. It's just a term, and it's like, okay, I'm one, but it, nothing's happening. Well, did you know you're just supposed to believe in that? Really, you're just supposed to believe that he died literally to make you one. And so I, I believe you. You're the one who did it. I wasn't there, or at least I didn't see it, so, you know. So I believe this based on, you know, so, we, so here's what we would do then. We would go, well, I don't deserve to be one with you. And, you know, see, be thankful I'm not God. Because I would just reach over and go, would you pay attention? <laughs> you know. Uh, because it's not based on you deserving it. He didn't do it because you deserved it. He didn't make you one because you deserved it. In fact, most of us are at the, our very worst when he comes. Right? And, and regularly comes when we're at our worst. <laughs> and, um, and it's at those times, okay, I'm at my worst. Don't, don't come to me now, you know. Because I know I don't deserve it. I know. <laughs> and he's just going, you know, get it all out. You know, I'm just waiting patiently because I'm God. <laughs> Could you pick it up a little bit? You know, eternity's coming. <clears throat> right? <clears throat> So, you know, the best thing to do is when he comes and we're, we're in that state is we just say, you know, I don't feel like it. I don't look like it. I don't act like it. I, I got nothing except you. Amen. And I'm one with you. I'm not, I don't just have something wonderful. I have a wonderful husband while I'm a creep. <laughs> <laughs> you know? That's not it, you know. It is, I have a wonderful husband with whom I am one, you know. <clears throat> um, 
a good a good song to listen to that might help you with this is one that I wrote and sang called um, Farewell to Satan. Yeah, that's what it is. Farewell to Satan. And uh, there's a line in there that that he's, you know, the song the person is talking to the devil and saying, you know, if <clears throat> if you, you know. If you're upset because I'm now with Jesus and you can't take the loss, then you need to go to him and take it up with my boss. You know, <clears throat> there is a reality. You know, I remember even when I was in, as carnal as a stump, and I would, you know, I remember looking up the word paraclete, you know, and that means like a lawyer or something like that. And I went, you know, the devil would mess with me. I'd say, look, you need to talk to my lawyer. I ain't saying nothing. I ain't going to get in an argument with you or expose or reveal anything. Because <laughs> I could say a lot of stuff that could, you know, what's, it, what's the word? Uh, all of those words you said. <laughs> you know. And uh, uh, so, you know, talk to my attorney. See. And it really worked because it was the same thing. I just matured as I went along, you know. <clears throat> and uh, now he just doesn't talk to me at all anyway. <laughs> but, um, okay, so let me try to, can I? Where is this possible for me to finish at least part of this? Okay, I don't think it is. So we are going to stop right here. Now remember, <clears throat> I think this is a true statement. Let's see if I can even say it right. But many times when we laugh in class and stuff, it's because it's an uncomfortable way of dealing with stuff that's true. <laughs> or a comfortable way of dealing with it, actually, with something that's uncomfortable or whatever. Uh, it's better that we laugh than cry. <laughs> but the good news is it really is true and we really are those ways but the truth is greater than that the truth is a person and we are we are to cleave which is what abiding in the vine is we see abiding in the vine as just kind of holding on to the trunk or whatever you know I'm just, I'm holding on. I'm just barely, but I'm holding on. But if you saw it in a love relationship, you would see it as cleaving. Remember Mary Magdalene did that to Jesus when she saw it. Because she's crying, where have you, what have you done with, you know, you know. You, you, you can, if you really look at that, you can see where her heart was. Where is him? Where is the hymn of this whole story. <clears throat> and when, when he said, it is I, you know, she wanted to just cleave to him. Abide. Hold on. Keep pointing to him. Stop pointing to yourself. But keep believing that oneness will manifest in you eventually if it's true. And it is true. See, it's not untrue. You can't untrue oneness. <laughs> you know, you can't. You can only give up on it because, you know, like Sarah. Like Sarah. You give up on it. Don't give up because it's true. Father, we thank you and we bless you for your son for the one that came and and was the one and yet he said at that day you shall know that I am in my father and he in me and I in you and you in me 
So, Father, that day is a different day for each person as we pursue to seek you. It's settled already. It is true in you, but we want the fullness of that truth in us so that we walk with you according to life and not clarity of doctrine. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.